For almost a century, we've been captivated and sometimes terrified by the big questions of artificial intelligence. Questions like, will computers ever become truly intelligent? What'll happen if machines develop a conscience? Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium. In this episode of Perspectives, six experts in the fields of robotics, sci-fi, and philosophy discuss breakthroughs in the development of AI that are both good and a bit worrisome. We begin now with a major milestone in the field of artificial intelligence, the development of the Turing test. Enjoy. In 1950, Turing published his definitive philosophical piece on the question of minds and machines and information. Can a machine think? That question, he says, is too meaningless to merit attention. There, perhaps, we see the influence of Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein said that asking whether a machine can think is like asking whether the number three has a color. Turing rejects, can a machine think, as meaningless, but proposes replacing that question with one that isn't meaningless. It's called the Turing test. Could you build a machine that under specified conditions was indistinguishable from a person? If your communication was limited to written questions and responses by email, would you be able to tell whether it was a person or a machine on the other end? Turing's article on the Turing test were a major instigation for the field of artificial intelligence, a term that wasn't invented until after Turing's death in 1954. In 1956, a group of collaborators put together a Dartmouth summer research project on, they didn't know quite what to call it, but eventually settled on the Dartmouth summer research project on artificial intelligence. The theme was clearly along Turing's lines of inquiry. The conference was explicitly based on the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. There were actually two branches of artificial intelligence that came out of the conference. One involved straight programming on the model of the Turing machine. The other involved the first explorations in neural nets, another line of thought that Turing had anticipated. Neural networks have variables that can be set to any possible numeric value, allowing fine-scale control over their behavior. In practice, this fine-scale control often works like the sliders on a mixing board that sound engineers use. It's not just on-off or the counting numbers 1, 2, 3, up to 10, it's also everything in between. So thanks to this very fine-scale control, Neural networks give us an approach to machine learning that can build much more complicated systems of rules using very low-level inputs, such as sound or images. These more complicated systems of rules would be hard for humans to derive explicitly, or even fully understand. Humans don't think of pictures in terms of pixels or sounds in terms of sound waves. And yet, focusing on these low-level features is what makes it possible for machines to solve perceptual problems on our behalf. Neural networks allow machines to do the hard work of identifying higher-level patterns from lower-level inputs. For example, words from acoustic signals, people from images of their faces, letters from handwritten stroke information, and breeds of dogs from photographs. Deep learning, which has exploded in impact and popularity since 2015, is just an approach to building and training neural networks with many layers. The first generally accepted passing of the Turing test was ELISA, a computer program written in 1965 at MIT by the German-born computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum, a Jewish scientist who fled the rise of Nazism. ELISA was the first chatterbot, or bot as we now call them. It was a complex program that allows for conversational exchanges in natural language as it's generally spoken. ELISA was set up to simulate the conversation between a patient and a psychiatrist, using recognizable linguistic patterns and pre-programmed relations between terms, ELISA was able to carry on conversations that really did seem exactly like those one would have with a therapist. Request for clarification. 
Why do you think you're worried about the future? Or questions that would naturally follow from a claim were asked. You say you've been away from home a lot. Could you tell me about your family life? Many of those who interacted with Eliza were convinced that it could not be a computer program. Indeed, some still thought that Eliza was human, even after being shown what it was and having received a detailed explanation as to how it works. However, we have yet to achieve true artificial intelligence. Why is that? Primarily because no one really knows what intelligence means. I'm going to call this the problem of self-awareness. The problem is that no two researchers in AI seem to agree on what self-awareness means. To give you an idea of the scope of this problem, a 2009 paper on artificial intelligence lists no less than 28 distinct models of consciousness. These models define the approaches that researchers use to try to achieve artificial intelligence. Some approaches, like using neural networks for problem solving, are bottom up. They start from a level that is similar to how neurons in the brain interact and try to build useful systems from that. Some are top down. They attempt to model large scale systems in the brain, like recognizing patterns using more general strategies and ignoring the bottom levels. Some approaches have different subsystems which interact together and use feedback between them. Some researchers use the human brain as a model and some ignore it. Some researchers believe that building a true thinking machine is impossible. Others that will be achieved in a few decades, maybe less. I think that creating a true thinking machine is possible because nature has already done it in the form of a human brain. How we will create it, either by growing it in a vat or programming it in silicon or some other method, I don't know. But if we accept that the laws of nature allow natural intelligence, recreating it artificially is possible. By the 1960s, Asimov was nearly as well known for his popular science books as for his science fiction writing. So it's not surprising that Asimov would want to explore the possible benefits of technology. And together with the legendary science fiction editor John W. Campbell Jr., he tried to alleviate fears of robot uprisings by coming up with his Three Laws of Robotics, which has proved to be one of the most durable, enduring ideas in science fiction. A version of them even does show up in that iRobot movie, one of the few elements of As Asimov's stories to survive in that film. They're essentially programming rules. The three laws are, one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human, human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. This is really kind of a clever logical trap with each law overruling the one below it. The idea was to set up a system of simple rules that would prevent for example, somebody using a robot to commit murder or to go on these destructive rampages such as we saw in those earlier pulp stories. Neural networks, reinforcement learning, and other methods of creating artificial intelligence can make it difficult to figure out why a machine made a particular decision. Because their choices emerge from the learning algorithms on which they're trained, it's hard to pinpoint the cause of a decision. But that's true, too, of the vast majority of the decisions that we make including those of judges, mortgage brokers, and doctors. The difference is that we can force makers of AI to find out the cause of the decision, but we can't force it out of other humans. So what are the implications of programming an AI that can explain its decisions? In order for the AI to explain a decision, it needs to know itself. In a sense, it needs to be made conscious of its own thinking or have some kind of metacognition. When classifying a face as male or female, the machine would have to explain how it came to make that choice. Was it a particular feature, a relationship between features, a probabilistic map of features? And in this, we're bound to gain a deeper understanding of our own metacognition, and ultimately maybe even our own consciousness. 
Perhaps the best use of AI, and the least scary, is as a partner. Since computers are much better than we are at brute force calculations and search, we can outsource those tasks and benefit greatly. Say you want to build a new car, for instance. There are many different parts and options to consider, each with its own pros and cons. By building a digital twin or a digital replica of your design, you can simultaneously test out many different versions using digital simulations. Before AI, engineers had to do much of this work themselves, testing and retesting prototypes. But now they can outsource it to machines and get answers much more quickly. That means that they can spend the extra time on the more creative tasks, innovating and connecting, which is what we humans do better, so far, than our computer counterparts. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.